Good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, depending upon the areas of the world which you, you belong to. Well, I, am, I, have I have great pleasure to welcome all of you to the, our webinar series of Learn from the Legends. Today we are entering the 15th episode of the uh, webinar series in which we are bringing the true legends of neonatology to in front of you. Today, really, we had a great legend that is Dr. Niranjan Thomas, who is going to speak us on the basic concepts and uh, the uh, cooling process of therapeutic hypothermia in resource limited settings. I have great pleasure to welcome Dr. Niranjan Thomas to this platform. Welcome, sir. And the moderators of this session are Dr. Vishnu Bhatt, who is the head of the Department of Pediatrics and Neonatology from Chipmar Pondicherry, and Dr. Sunil Kishore, who is the consultant neonatologist at the Medicover Hospital, Vaisak. I welcome both moderators to this program. And I welcome all of the delegates from all, all, all part of the globe to this wonderful learning experience. Thank you and over to the moderators. Good afternoon to one and all. Uh, it is uh, my duty to welcome Dr. Niranjan Thomas and I am also thankful to the organizer for inviting me to be here. I have a co-chairperson uh, or moderator, Dr. Sunil Kishore, who is from Vaisak. And uh, I am asked to introduce the topic. See, as you know, perinatal asphyxia is a very important issue, especially in developing country like ours, where almost 30% of the mortality is uh, neonatal mortality is related to perinatal asphyxia. And about 60% of those who had significant asphyxia will develop uh, uh, handicap or they may become children with special needs. So it's an important issue. And uh, various treatments have been tried among which uh, therapeutic hypothermia probably is the most important. And uh, we have Dr. Niranjan Thomas who will be introduced by my colleague later. But uh, he is the one who has start, uh, done this uh, miracle experiment and uh, now many centers are using this uh, Miracle for cooling or poor man's cooling system. <clears throat> now the question comes, when to cool, whom to cool, when not to cool, that's very important. So one should know when not to cool or when to stop cooling. And uh, if you cool everybody and uh, in uh, different circumstances, outcome may not be good. So many times what happens, people uh, cool and then uh, baby dies. After that, they say, okay, this is a very dangerous thing. So there is problem in selection of case and also the method of cooling. So Dr. Niranjan will discuss and he will tell us whom should be cooled and where we get the maximum benefit and how long to cool, when to rewarm, how to rewarm and what are the complications we can develop. Many people may think, okay, whether we can cool the preterm babies, whether only term babies we cooled, so these questions also need to be answered. And uh, in our setup, there are uh, few referral centers and uh, infants have to be transferred from long distance. So many times uh, transport is a bigger issue, whether we can cool like Western countries during transport. These are some issues uh, which you may have to see. Another important issue may be follow up of these babies. Unless we do long term follow up, uh, what happens, what is the real outcome? after five years, 10 years, what happens? That cannot be answered. All the, most of the follow-up studies uh, be around uh, one and a half to two years, not more. So I think we need to follow them up. Uh, and uh, I should not uh, give on talking, I keep on talking because I will reduce the time of the speaker uh, speaking. And I hand over the stage to my colleague, Dr. Sunil Kumar, Sunil Kishore, introduce uh, Dr. Niranjan Thomas. Dr. Sindhu, yeah. Kishore. Yeah, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very much. So, and it's uh, really my privilege to introduce Dr. Niranjan Thomas, sir. Sir is currently working as consultant uh, neonatologist in uh, John Kirner Women and Children Hospital in Melbourne, Australia for the last uh, one year. So before that, sir was working as professor and head of the department in uh, neonatology 
in uh, CMC Vellur. Sir has done his fellowship in uh, neonatal and perinatal medicine from Sick Kids Hospital uh, in Canada. And his medical training was uh, from, from MD as well as DNP from uh, CMC Vellur. And uh, to his credit, Sir has uh, 61 publications uh, in indexed journals. And he is journal reviewer for many international journals like uh, ADC, BMJ, and Lancet Global. So more than above all, Sir has developed Mira, Mira Cradle, uh, which works on principles of uh, PCM, phase changing matter, material, which is a low cost device for neuroproduction and therapeutic hypothermia. And it's being used in more than 100 hospitals in India as well as uh, abroad also. And Sir has patent for uh, Mira Cradle and a big applause for that. Uh, having so much of having done so much of work in uh, therapeutic hypothermia and uh, neuroproduction uh, for today's topic i don't think anybody else can do better justice than uh, sir so over to you sir uh, before that a small request to, to all the participants so all of you like whoever is posting queries and comments as well as any questions please post in q and a box not the chat box please post in q and a box uh, so that we will be able to take up at the end of the session. Over to you, sir. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Dr. Sunil and Dr. Vishnu Bhatt, sir, for your kind words. Uh, known you for many years, and we have good relationships. Uh, I'll start sharing my screen now. So good evening, everyone, and greeting from Melbourne. It's uh, only 10.45 in the night here, but uh, I'm quite excited, even though it's nearly the middle of the night, to be part of this program. It is my pleasure and privilege to be part of this webinar series, and Manoj and his team need to be congratulated on their effort. Um, when I Initially, when I heard about the... IAP Neocon being cancelled, I thought, oh, this is a COVID disaster. But it's been beautiful the way it's been adapted by the team to deliver something that's even better, a series of high quality talks that go throughout the year. I, I take this opportunity to thank Manoj, his team and the IAP Neocon for inviting me to be part of this webinar series. As Many of you may be aware, I worked for more than 20 years at uh, Christian Medical College Bello, and this is the centenary building where I spent nearly two decades of my life as a neonatologist. Before I moved to the Joan Kerner Children's, Women and Children's Hospital in Melbourne a year ago. And the Joan Kerner Women's and Children's Hospital is the fifth NICU that has been started in Victoria, and it opened in September 2019, and I'm happy to be part of the team that is building up this unit. Before I start, I need to make some disclosures. Uh, the disclosure is that I, I was involved in the development of the Mira Cradle and I hold two patents. But however, I do not have any financial benefits, neither from the development or from the sale of the Mira Cradle. Now, when uh, Manoj asked me initially uh, to give this talk on the basic concepts and with a focus on low resource settings. I was not sure because uh, uh, cooling has been happening for more than nearly two decades in high income countries and in CMC Valor, we have been cooling from 2007. So I'm not sure exactly what people would want or know already. So I asked a couple of my students uh, previous students who are themselves consultants now, and also asked some of my colleagues in CMC what I should focus on. So there are six questions that I, that, that I from the feedback that I got, which are challenges for cooling babies in low resource, in resource limited settings. The first question is, should you cool babies in the settings at all? Is it safe? Are we sure we should be able to cool babies in the settings? The second is, 
what facilities or setting should we cool in? Can we do it in every, every hospital or is there a certain thing that we need to have infrastructure before we can start cooling? The third is who should you cool? Is there any differences in patient selection between high income countries and ours and between the trials that are already conducted and what we should be doing? How should you cool? Is there any alternatives that we can use as far as equipment goes? How do you monitor and follow up these babies? We heard Dr. Vishnu Bhatt sir saying that it's so important that we have long-term follow-up. How do we monitor for complication and how do you follow up these babies? And the sixth question is, do you, do you need amplitude integrated EEG and MRI as a must before you start cooling? So the first question, should we cool babies? When we talk about in any intervention, there are three things that needs to be answered. Safety, feasibility, and efficacy. Any intervention needs to be safe. It should be feasible in your setting. And it should demonstrate that it's the benefit outweighs the harm in, in terms of efficacy. So can we have the first poll? Do you believe that there is enough evidence on safety, feasibility, and efficacy in cooling in mid-income countries, low mid-income countries like India. So we have 66 persons, about two thirds of them who believe there is enough evidence on safety, feasibility and efficacy to cool babies in low mid-income countries like India. And about one third says there is not enough evidence. That's good to know. So let me see, let's see what. So if you look at the evidence, this is a Cochrane review that meta-analysis that has eight trials, a total of 1,334 newborns. What it shows showed was that therapeutic hypothermia reduced the risk of death and major disability with a relative risk of 0.75. So there's about 25% reduction in death or disability. And the number needed to treat us was seven. And not only did it decrease death and disability, it also increased the rate of survival of those survivors with normal neurological function at 18 months. Now, if you look at common interventions in neonatology, a number needed to treat of seven is very good. For example, much better than even surfactant therapy. The problem is that all these trials were done in high income countries. So we cannot really postulate whether this, can we use this evidence and say that we can cool in low mid-income countries like India? Well, we can, we could, because if you look at surfactant therapy, nobody really studied it in other countries. They just adapted it to, to low and middle-income countries. Now, there are some arguments against cooling in low and middle-income countries like India. The first thing is people feel that it's unsafe, mainly because of the fact that there is unregulated practice and the quality of intensive care is not always the same everywhere. And more importantly, there is a feeling that it might not be as effective as in high income countries. The biological plausibility put forth is that there is more infection in India. So when you have infection, there is what is called the double hit theory. So in the background of chorioamnionitis, the brain is already injured as you all know because of cytokines. And on top of that, you have a double hit with asphyxia the theory is that cooling will not be beneficial. The second biological plausibility theory that has been put forward is the fact that many of the babies in countries like India are small for gestational age and already have chronic hypoxia with established brain injury. And we know that cooling helps only in the first six hours in the latent period. So it may not really help in these babies. In addition to this, there are factors like lack of infrastructures, many home deliveries, poor transport that's already been mentioned by Dr. Vishnu, but so babies come very late 
present very late with brain injury. In addition, there is poor cooling, cooling practices, the so-called poor cooling practices, I would say, using low-tech methods, cooling babies with mild encephalopathy and a lack of sedation. So these are the theories or these are the points that have been put forward by people who believe that cooling should not be done in low and middle income countries or in low resource settings like India. Now let's look at the safety. So I said we need to look, demonstrate safety, feasibility and efficacy. So looking at safety and feasibility, this is a table that shows the Indian studies that have been done so far looking at safety and feasibility. So we have studies from Velour, Pondicherry, Calicut, Manipal, St. John's Bangalore, and also two multicentric tiles that have looked at cooling babies in India. The total number of babies that have been cooled so far, if I count all these studies, is about 654 babies. The study, the Tecotherm Helix study, that is a multicentric tri trial that took place in in Chandas in Chennai, Pondicherry, Bangalore, Mumbai, and Calicut, showed that there was a 50% baby, 50 of the babies actually had gastric bleeds, and there was a 20% mortality, which is acceptable. And these babies are all babies who are sick with moderate to severe encephalopathy. All the trials, all of them reported that it was safe and feasible. In 2013, uh, Polia and et al published a meta-analysis in PLOS One journal. They looked at all the RCTs that had been done in low and middle income countries, and they looked at mortality and they found that even though there was a trend towards a reduced mortality 0.74 relative risk, there, it was not statistically significant. So the conclusion of this was that cooling in low and middle income countries does not decrease neonatal mortality. None of the studies looked at long-term outcome, which is what we're really interested in. And many of the studies were small in number. The next year in 2014, there was another meta-analysis that, that was published by Alan Hall from uh, South Africa, his group. They looked at all the trials that use low technology methods basically cool gel packs at that point of time, phase, phase changing material has not really come out. And they found that actually there was a reduction in immediate mortality at the time of hospital discharge with a relative risk of 0.6 and a, and a decreased mortality of six to 24 months with a relative risk of 0.63. However, they, most of this was influenced as you can see by one trial which is Jacobs and all et al at 2011, which was the ICE trial, which actually looked at cool gel packs, but the, it was done in Australia and Canada. This is something that is difficult for us to say that it's the same in low control trial. They looked at 18 month outcome using the DASI. And what they found was that there was a significant about 20% reduction in mortality and a 70% reduction in neurological abnormality at 18 months when those who were given cooling, which is quite an effect size. However, the, what the neurological abnormality was is not clearly defined, but I, I assume that it is abnormal DASI score. We published our, uh, the thin study also this year in the archives of disease in uh, childhood, fetal and neonatal edition. And this was a thin study, which looked, which was again a randomized control trial. We randomized 50 babies, 25 to hypothermia and 25 to standard care. Babies who fulfilled the criteria for cooling the staging. These babies were randomized and put into either cooling or standard care. Those who were cooled were cooled to 33.5 degrees for 72 hours within seven, six hours of life and then rewarmed slowly over the next 12 hours. Those in the standard group were maintained at 37 degrees, which was 
and the temperatures in both groups were continuously monitored, monitored for the first 90 hours. We recorded all complications, standard of care, for, uh, the treatment for both groups were the same other than the cooling. The primary outcome that we looked at was what is called a fractional anisotrophy using deficient tensor imaging. So this is an MRI biomarker, which is what it does it, it looks as actually the amount, it quantitates, the quantitates. Slides are, the slides are not really? moving in there. No, no, I'm still talking on this slide. Okay, fine. Uh, what it does is it quantitates what uh, fractional an an anisotropy does is what is called tracked based statial st spatial statistics, which actually quantifies the exact amount of brain damage. That's in very simplistic terms. And it uses, used, uses an automated system to do this. The advantage of using this biomarker is the sample size needed to make a difference for a neuroprotective agent is as small as 10 in each group. So that is why we chose a sample size of 25 in each group, because this would give us a 90% 90 po 90 power to detect a 10% change. So when you look at the primary outcome, what did we see? What we saw was there was a significant difference in the fractional an anisotropy and the mean diffusibility in the between the two groups. And this was this, the main thing was it was in the except for the corpus callosum, the plic, the thalamus, the midbrain, the lentiform nucleus, all of them there was a definite significant difference between in the MRI changes in mean those who are cooled versus those who are not cooled. Our secondary outcome we followed up these babies periodically every three months till eighteen months of age. We did a general movements assessment at three months. And we also did a Bailey's uh, at 18 to 24 months. The MRI outcomes, both the conventional and the uh, uh, TBSS was blinded, was done by the group in Norway and uh, UK. The long-term follow-up was done by the developmental pediatrician and the clinical psychologist Mello, who are also blinded to which group these babies were in. So what did we see? What we saw was the composite outcome of death and disability was significantly different between the two groups. So there's about more than 50% reduction in death and disability in those who were cooled as compared to those who were not cooled. And if you look at the conventional MRI, remember that the secondary outcomes were not powered to detect, but if you look at the conventional MRI, again, there was a significant difference between the num percentage of babies who had moderate or severe abnormal um, abnormality in the MRI. So 43% versus 9%. And this was statistically significant. What is more interesting also was the pattern of MRI injury. So what, as I mentioned before, the one of the theory is that if you have infection or if you have small for gestational age, your brain has, has already suffered an insult and therefore cooling doesn't work. Now we know that acute asphyxia damages the basal ganglia and the thalamus, whereas cro the chronic asphyxia or what we expect to see in SJ babies is white matter injury. But what we found was that 65% of the babies actually had basal ganglia or global injury as compared to only uh, less than 20% who had white matter injury, suggesting that this was majority of babies in a low, low resource setting also suffer acute asphyxia. So what did this RCT show us in the end of it? What we saw was, as I mentioned, pattern of injury on MRI suggests acute injury similar to the high income countries. And cool babies have less injury on MRI, both on conventional and fractional anisotrophy. And there was a decreased composite outcome of death and disability at 18 months. So that brings me to the end of the first question. That is, should we cool babies in low and middle income countries? Hopefully if we re-poll, I, I hope that I have convinced people that in an NICU setting, so I, I need to be careful about what I say, in a setting, in an NICU setting where we have adequate intensive care, 
in a controlled hypothermia does improve efficacy in those babies who suffer from HIE. So safety, feasibility and efficacy, I think, has been adequately demonstrated. And we, I do know that the HELIX trial is awaited. We need to see the results. But again, I'll stress on the settings because these studies have all been done in good neonatal intensive care setting. The HELIX trials is more in a public hospital setup. So that we'll go to the next question. So before we start addressing the next question, can we have a poll on this? Where should babies be cooled? Level three NICU, level two special care nursery, either of the above. Okay, it's interesting to see that 21% feel that uh, you can cool in a special level two nursery also. Interesting to see that. Anyway, we will go to... Th so when we address the question, where should we cool babies? I think that there is no doubt that these babies are all very sick babies. There's no doubt about it. It is not just the cooling process the process of looking after an asphyxiated babies requires quite a lot of intensive care. And on top of that, cooling produces its own side effect, which needs to be looked after. So a level three NICU could be various level three NICUs, but what, what they should be, it's mandatory that these places where you cool babies should be able to provide ventilation, should be able to have central venous and arterial access, should be able to administer inotropes because many of these babies have hypotension, should be able to give blood product support because many of these babies bleed, should have adequate nursing care because cooling babies, especially if you're using low tech instru uh, instruments or equipment, need much more uh, intensive nursing care. You should be able to continuously monitor vitals. It's not just intermittent, you need to have continuous monitoring of vitals because things can change very fast. And you must be able to offer long-term neurodevelopmental follow-up. Uh, amplitude e integrated EEG is preferable, but not mandatory. As is also an MRI, it's preferable, but not mandatory. Now, this can be contested about the MRI, but we'll address that a little later. The third question is, who should be cooled? That is, which are the babies that we should select for cooling? And I'm not sure if we are able to get this poll working. Uh, were we able to get this poll working? No, there is a snag. Okay, so we will continue. Uh, that's that's okay. We will continue in that. I will I will not pause. Okay. So, if we look at who 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 are the babies that we should cool. Like we have ABC, airway, breathing, and circulation. We have A, but it doesn't have, uh, it doesn't fit A, but I have an A, B, and C. A is the mandatory criteria. So the babies that we cool are basically the term and near term babies. We do not cool preterm babies as yet. We do not have evidence. And, I, and there is probably more harm than benefit by cooling preterm babies. So this baby should be more than 35 weeks, should have more than weight of more than 1.8 kilos, because the smaller the baby, the more the complication. And also the cooling should be started within the first six hours of life. Now, the reason why the first six hours of life is because of it's initially based on animal experiments that showed that when you have uh, sheep, uh, uh, lamb who were cooled, the benefit of cooling went away if they were cooled beyond 5.5 hours of age. And this is to do with the latent period. So we are, we are trying to trying to uh, start the process before the secondary energy failure. So we need the latent period is about four to six hours. So we try to catch them. 
we do know also that if you cool within the first three hours, you get better, better benefit than if you cool between three to six hours. So that's the second point that we need to keep in mind. And the third thing is the, the randomized control trial by the NICHD, which looked at cooling between six to 24 hours, did not show that much benefit. Okay, There was only a 2% benefit, which was not really that much. So I think we should still follow the criteria that within six hours of life, there has been a therapeutic drift, even in the, I mean, all the high income countries. So people, even if they come at seven, eight hours are still cooling, but we need to keep in mind that as far as possible, we have to try to see whether we can cool within the first six hours of life. So the mandatory criteria is gestation more than 35 weeks, birth weight more than 1.8 kilos and within the six, first six hours of life. The second is physiological criteria. So it could be any one of these following criteria and is slightly different from what the trials and the Western countries go because they do not have this whole group of babies that we do not have APGA scores outborn. So the commonest clinical presentation in India would be a baby coming in three hours, four hours, five hours of age with seizures. And we have this history of not having cried at birth or having required resuscitation. The APCA scores given is usually not accurate. So this is a group of babies that is very, very peculiar to our setting. So I will first talk about inborn. So if you have the facility of having inborn baby or rather the advantage of having inborn babies, if the APCA score at five minutes is less than equal to five. So this is another thing. So many people take 10 minutes and most of the trials have looked had has done 10 minutes, but we know that a five minute APCA is probably will have less false negatives in the sense that it has cast a wider net. So if you, if you go by the five minute APCA less, less than five and abnormal neurology are more likely to recruit the correct amount of babies. So either a 10 minute or a five minute APGA, we, in, we, have, we follow the five minute APGA less than five. If you have a cord pH or a gas within the first one hour of life, the pH is less than seven or the base deficit more than 12. And if you're continuing to require resuscitation or positive pressure ventilation at 10 minutes of age. So this is a criteria which, which should fulfill the physiological criteria. For outborn babies, generally we do not have the APGA score. So usually we work we have some history of not having cried at birth, baby not breathing, required some assistance. And this is, a, this is a clue that tells us that that baby has probably suffered asphyxia. The third is the neurological criteria, which is a presence of moderate or severe encephalopathy or any seizures. A baby has seizures automatically is classified as having abnormal uh, neuro neurology, or you must examine the baby and demonstrate moderate or severe encephalopathy. So how do you demonstrate moderate or severe encephalopathy? So the two large trials, the TOBI trial and NSCHT trial approach it slightly differently. The TOBI trial looked at uh, any altered state of consciousness. So any lethargy, stupor or coma, and at least one of either hypotonia, abnormal reflexes, absent or weak stuck suck or clinical seizures. And they also had an AEG criteria. The NICHD criteria had what is called the modified Sarnath staging, and they did not have an AEG criteria at all. So to recruit a baby for cooling, the NICHD just used the clinical Sarnath staging. So here you have six, six areas, level of consciousness, spontaneous activity, posture, tone, primitive reflexes, autonomic system. So if, if in any of the six, three out of the six either are moderate or severe, then you, you classify them as abnormal neurology. Some people also do the Thompson score, but this is not very popular. And if a score is more than eight, would fulfill the criteria for cooling. The advantage of the Thompson score is that it gives you a number and that number you can follow up to see if the baby is worsening or getting better. So once again, you have ABC, and you have to have all fulfilled, not just one. So you have the mandatory criteria of more than 35 weeks, more than 1.8 kilos within six hours. You have a physiological criteria of a low upgar or a low cord pH or not having cried at birth or required resuscitation. And you must have abnormal neurology. So you, you just you, you cannot cool a baby just based on low upgar or low cord pH. 
that baby must have abnormal neurology moderate or severe and based on either the um, sarna staging or or the uh, the tobi which i showed you now dr vishnubhat mentioned that we should also know who not to cool so that's also very important case selection not not only who to cool but who not to cool so less than 35 weeks less than 1.8 kilos and more than 6 hours of weight should not be offered cooling if you have major congenital abnormality so how do we decide whether they would benefit or it would do more harm you can just ask yourself the question is this major congenital anomaly something that i would offer intensive care if it's a anomaly that you would offer intensive care ordinarily if that baby is asphyxiated then maybe the benefit of therapeutic hypothermia should be offered imperfect imperfect ns gives us a technical difficulty of not being able to monitor rectal thermometer temperature but this can be bypassed by having a esophageal probe which is not easily available but it can be done the other thing is if you have a coagulopathy with active ble bleeding what we have seen is those babies who are already bleeding with coagulopathy cooling really worsens it and a couple of babies that we have lost has been because of bleeding Uh, and we've had to had to bail out early because of this the other thing is severe pphn so you could high frequency and nitric on, and cooling is possible with pphn but we do know that cooling can worsen pphn so generally if a baby is hypoxic and extreme pphn we would think twice before offering therapeutic hypothermia other thing is those in extremis that is those who have who are extremely sick so for in in velour what we used to do was any baby who has not established spontaneous respiration by 30 minutes we would not offer intensive care and we would not offer cooling so this is a babies that have severe encephalopathy and the benefit that you get in severe encephalopathy is not as good as that you get in moderate encephalopathy so you need to choose to decide so these are not fixed criteria i mean these are not these are the criteria that you have to work around depending on where you work and what setting you are doing and what you feel about the ethics of this now the process of cooling involves three things the actual process of cooling the equipment that you use and what is the monitoring that you do for these babies again i think the poll is not poll is not holding so we'll go to the next so the, when you look at the process of cooling there are three phases in cooling one is the first phase is the induction phase second phase is the maintenance phase and third phase is the rewarming phase now the induction phase as i mentioned already earlier the cooling better the outcome so you need to try to get the baby down to target temperature that is 33 to 34 33.5 to be exact as soon as possible so if as far as possible most people try to aim for at least by 30 minutes should be as fast as possible and that's why the servo control devices i think are much better than that they really bring down the temperature quite fast now the second thing is during the induction phase do you offer passive cooling post resuscitation now this is something that needs to be dealt with unit by unit because it depends so what we do know that many babies who have a low apgar or low cord page many of them actually do not develop encephalopathy they recover or they have mild encephalopathy so if you have a baby who has got significant asphyxia significant resuscitation you could turn off the warmer as you uh, wait for the neurology to be checked before you start active cooling third thing is you need to do a neurological examination before induction and you need to document it is important that you document so in velour what we have is a formal sarnath staging where we tick every half an hour to one hour when the baby comes to the unit to demonstrate that we have fulfilled three out of the six before we start active cooling so it's important to do a formal neurological examination and document it before we do it you must remember whatever it is servo or non servo this initial induction phase is always a little bit of overshoot before it stabilizes to the 33.5 the second phase is the maintenance phase so we maintain therapeutic hypothermia for 72 hours so within 6 hours for 72 hours and the temperature that we aim is 33.5 giving a leeway of 0.5 degrees on either side so 33 to 34 degrees 
It is important during the maintenance phase to prevent fluctuations. What we want is babies in this gray zone. Temperature steady within this gray zone. We don't want it swinging up and down because whatever neuroprotection that you get is lost. And that has been shown in animal studies. For so this, servo control is better, no doubt about it. It's much more stable as compared to low-cost uh, equipment. During the maintenance phase, you should also avoid cold injury to the skin. So it's important that you check the skin and you change position every four hours at least. You must be careful about displacement of temperature probe and this is important both in the servo and non-servo because all your feedback and all your um, manipulation is based on what your rectal thermometer or your esophageal thermometer is reading. There's a lot of nursing involved, especially if you're using low-tech uh, devices and monitoring has to be constant. I'll come to the monitoring a little later, but this is very important. The rewarming phase is probably the most important because of the fact that we do know that rapid rewarming in adult studies have resulted in poor outcome in the loss of the neuroprotection. We know that there is hypotension due to vasodilatation. There is rebound hyperkalemia, hypoglycemia that has been noted. And rebound seizures as well has been reported during rewarming if it is done rapidly. So what is the rate at which you rewarm? You rewarm at the rate of 0.2 to 0.5 degrees per hour. So not more than 0.5 per hour. The slower it is, doesn't matter. So generally we aim for 0.2 per hour so that if, if at all it crosses, that doesn't matter, but it should not be more than 0.5. So it takes about eight to 12 hours for the baby to come back to normal temperature. Other thing important to remember during the rewarming is that you need to monitor for a few hours after the normal thermia to prevent rebound hyperthermia. That's important because what happens is once you hit the normal temperature, if you stop monitoring, it will continue to rise. And we know there are excellent studies that have shown that if you have hyperthermia, your neurodevelopment is worse, worse than if you have norm, even normal thermia. So you lose the benefit of cooling if you let the baby rebound to hyperthermia. So it's important to monitor the baby, continue to monitor the rectal temperature for several hours after the baby has reached the normal thermia after rewarming. Now, the third thing we said was, second thing we said was equipment. So we said the process, second is the equipment. So if you look at the equipment, the initially everybody talks about head cooling when you talk about therapeutic thermostat because that is the first thing that was in, introduced. So this is the Olympic cool cap system that was the first FDA approved equipment. So what, what it does is runs uh, cooled liquid around the scalp and that cools the body also down. But there are some concerns. One is that you cannot put AEG, you cannot do scans, difficult to do ultrasound. So it's, it limits your access. The second concern is the fact that because of the scalp being very cold, the superficial layer of the brain is much colder than the deep structures, the basal ganglia and thalamus. That's why I really want cooling. May not The gradient may not reach there. That is a concern. Though the studies have shown no difference in the outcome. So this is actually gone out of fashion. Also, this equipment is quite expensive. 25 lakhs was what they were quoting last I knew. So this has gone out of fashion. Not even the in, in the US where people are doing, where doing head cooling have switched over to whole body cooling. So if you look at whole body cooling, so the server control devices are available. The three standard ones are the blanket roll system, the techotherm system, and the critical system. These are all server controlled. They are automatic. You can, they usually work on the principle you have a jacket, which you circulate cold water or coolant. You have a rectal probe that feeds back to the machine. And if the temp baby's temperature goes up, the fluid temperature comes down. And that feedback keeps the baby's temperature 33.5 degrees for 72 hours. And the rewarming also, you can program to rewarm by 0.5 centimeters per hour. The problem is, of course, because they are server control, they are produced uh, by companies. They're expensive, anywhere between 15 to 18 lakhs when I last looked at it. May have become less now, but it's still a quite expensive. And the problem is that quite often when you have asphyxiated babies, like anything in neonatology, they'll come two, three at a time. So if you have one device, then you'll have to, what do you do for the second baby or the third baby that is in the unit that needs schooling? 
I'm not going to go further on these server control devices because they're really easy to understand. And the focus of this talk is what is the alternative equipment that we could use in low resource settings. Now, if you look at the equipments, uh, equipment uh, that, is, that you could use in low resource settings, the ones that have some data on it is one is passive cooling. So you could have babies who are just left exposed in air conditioned rooms. Uh, here, the problem is that not all of them will reach target temperature and you have no control over the temperature. One thing is that all asphyxiated babies in the first six to 12 hours after birth will drop their temperature. That's normal, normal. So you will achieve maybe the target temperature for the first few hours, but after that is very difficult. People have discovered have uh, described pots. There's a publication where the pots have been used to cool piglets. People have the Alan Horn and his group in South Africa has produced a server control fan. People have described water bottles, but I'm not going to talk about this because it's not really used that much. What we do use is cool gel packs and phase changing material. So I'll just concentrate on this. So if you look at cool gel packs, so cool gel packs are those that come in vaccine with vaccine in, in vaccine containers. So they are frozen and kept alongside vaccine to keep them cold. So these are actually frozen gels or frozen ice packs. And they're very, very cold. Obviously they're in the freezing temperature of zero degrees. So you cannot keep them directly on the baby. Some people keep them around them so, and what we used do in Velour, we used to do before when we were using cool gel packs in 2000, between 2007 and nine, was we used to wrap them in clean cloth and keep them in contact with the baby. So that is not very cold, but they, it draws the temp, uh, heat from the baby and cools the baby down. So this is how we use cool gel packs. The problem with cool gel packs is that it does not last more than 20 minutes, sorry, two to three hours. You need to change them again. And they're very cold and quite a lot of the babies shivered, the temperature tends to fall very rapidly down and there are quite a lot of swings. If you look at the safety and feasibility data of school gel packs, that is Indian data, we have published our study and what we got initially, we were aiming 33 degrees and we got 32.9 plus or minus 0.22, quite a narrow standard deviation. The JIPMA, Dr. Dr. Butts group has published several studies using cool gel packs. We have studies from St. John's and Manipal, all have used cool gel pack and found that the temperature control is within accepted. So you have a standard deviation of 0.34. If you look at most trials, the standard deviation was around 0.3 to 0.4. So this is quite acceptable what standard deviation we have. So this, it is feasible to use cool gel packs. It's not that we cannot use it. The other option, so when we started using cool gel packs, what we found was that it was quite labor intensive. So you, every two, three hours, somebody had to change the cool, the nurses had to change the cool gel packs. Quite often when you change a new pack, the temperature will drop suddenly down. And it, it, was, it was not as easy as we wanted it to be. So that's when we started looking at uh, other alternatives. So we came across the study uh, there was a piglet study that was uh, published in archives, which they cooled using phase changing materials from Sweden. The same uh, same uh, PCM was also used uh, in Calicut by Sudan Thail. So, but we had heard about the piglet study. So we actually Googled, I Googled and found out that there was one company in uh, Gurgaon, which was at producing phase changing material for the industry. So what is phase changing material? Phase changing material is just anything that will act like a heat sink. So as the solid absorbs heat, it changes from solid to liquid. That's the phase change, absorbing heat till it changes completely to liquid. So if you take ice, ice also is the phase changing material. So you keep a hot object on ice, that ice will absorb the heat from the hot object and continue to absorb till every last bit of ice changes to water, the temperature of that will not change. It will continue to absorb heat. So that the problem with ice is it's very cold, it's zero. So that means if you keep a baby on it, it'll keep on absorbing heat till the baby also reaches zero, I mean, theoretically. 
so we when when you say phase changing material these are all like salt hydrates so there is organic and non organic so the organic are fatty esters and the non organic are salt hydrates so they have a melting point so you can make a phase changing material with whatever melting point you want so we we asked the company to give us a melting point of 32 and we tried it didn't work so with many trial and error finally we found one phase changing material of melting point 31 which worked and we did a study the nine babies and we we built this bed so this was the cm cmc phase changing material bed which we presented in the 2012 uh, neocon and won the innovation award so this was the bed that we initially built so we had a insulated material here with a pouch where we kept the phase changing material and the baby lay on top of this so the material here is a good conductor so it conducts the heat from the baby who lies on this to the pcm the pcm absorbs the heat till it melts completely so we had to figure out how many kilograms to keep it was trial and error finally we worked out and this is what we got so this is a publication which we published in neonatology and you can see that the babies maintain a temperature 33.45 plus or minus 0.26 which was excellent comparable to server controlled devices this we then passed on to the industry who built the mera cradle and they actually came up with the idea of putting two types the 21 because what we found with our initial thing was the induction phase was much longer than what we wanted it took us about 90 minutes to get the baby to target temperature when we wanted actually 30 minutes so we used used cascaded system so used a, a 21 degree melting point phase changing material on top of the 29 degree one so that the initial part the heat is absorbed fast for induction and this melts and then this takes over so the mera cradle was then produced and is now being marketed we also looked at the temperature differences between those that were cooled with cool gel packs and those that were cooled with phase changing material and as you can see that the standard deviation with with the cool gel pack was 0.4 whereas it was much much narrow you can see in the diagram there is much much narrow interval a much more stable with phase changing material we then went and we did a multicentric trial uh, in which manoj also was part of where we looked at 10 centers throughout india and we demonstrated that it was not only cmc who could use it but other centers could also produce the similar results so here that was 33.5 plus or minus 0.39 now low cost devices cool gel packs and phase changing material there are some concerns not that they are the best there is more nursing input and they are more labor intensive especially with cool gel packs increased shivering has been reported with cool gel pack but this is not our experiences experiences phase changing material precise control is controlled is definitely less likely than server controlled devices obviously and it does not remove the need for intensive care and monitoring just because you have a cheap device doesn't mean that you can use it everywhere it still these babies are sick and need intensive care and monitoring now coming to the adverse effects of hypothermia if you look at any so cooling is actually counter intuitive for neonatologists we have all been always been taught for many many years that keep the babies warm and sweet so when we say <coughs> the adverse effects of hypothermia if you look up any textbook this is what you'll find increased mortality sclerema this is a baby with sclerema uh, oh, sorry scrub kidney fat necrosis skin erythema pulmonary hemorrhage renal failure increased blood viscosity DIC hypoglycemia acid base and electrolyte disturbances increased risk of infection hypotension cardiac arrest vtac pulmonary vasoconstriction the list goes on but if you actually look at the studies what they have shown is only a sinus bradycardia which is significant but that is not clinically relevant it's just the heart rate is low for these babies because their metabolism is low there is some thrombocytopenia again significant statistically but these did not clinically bleed and there was a increased trend to <coughs> pulmonary hypertension pphm now why is this because of the this is because of the fact this the hypothermia that is uh, here is controlled hypothermia it's not uncontrolled hypothermia 
Now, what is necessary to know also is the fact that swings in temperature should not be there as far as possible because swinging temperatures are associated with cardiovascular instability and emergence or re-emergence of seizures. And also there is a possible loss of neuroprotection. Shivering and pain also may worsen outcome and sedation and analgesia are very important. Now, if you go to monitoring, what do you monitor? So temperature needs to be monitored continuously and this needs to be core temperature. Skin temperature is not adequate and we have shown in, in our studies that skin temperature, do they correlate, they, do, they are not precise, they are not accurate or precise. So you need to have continuous rectal or esophageal temperature with the skin as a backup. We need to record every few minutes, 15 minutes the still for the first four hours, the stability is occurred and then you need to record every one hour till rewarming is over. Normally what we would do is we will continue to record till about 96 hours. Vital signs need to be monitored continuously, heart rate, oxygen, blood pressure and urine output. So we should have ECG leads, you should have invasive blood pressure monitoring with arterial line, this is what we advise. The reason being is that the there are centers who did not do not use this and have reported picking up hypotension much later. Remember that cool babies is very difficult to go by clinical signs because the CRT will be pro prolonged. They will look cyanosed. And so it's always good to have invasive blood pressure monitoring. Central access is good. You need to have saturation monitoring and urinary catheterization of bag monitoring. And all this has to be recorded hourly. You need to change position and check skin for cold in injury at least every four hours. Neurology has to make, be assessed at least once a day till rewarming is finished. You can use the Sarnath or the Thompson. So we normally recruit with the Sarnath and then monitor. At that time, we, when we start cooling, we document Thompson and we continue to document Thompson because it gives you a total score, which is easy to keep track of. At one week of age or the time of discharge, it is good to have a formal neurological assessment. So either the Amyl Tyson, Hammersmith or the TIMP. This is what we do. We use the ML Tyson and TIMP. Hammersmith, I know that SRMC uses this. So this is something that we need to do at, as a formal neurological assessment at the time of discharge. AEG, if it's available, is good to do. And this is how we would record AEG at the start of cooling, AEG at 24 hours, AEG at 48 hours, etc. So that you can, it helps us in the prognostication. Neuroimaging, we would do an ultrasound with the Doppler in the initial part, but more often on between day five to seven, we would do an MRI with the MRS. Lab monitoring is important. Babies can get hypo or hyperglycemia. Both of it is well described and both of it is said to worsen outcomes. So it's important to monitor blood sugars, important to monitor counts, especially platelet counts can drop. Coagulopathy needs to be treated aggressively and you need to monitor electrolytes and creatinine. We do a liver function test sometimes in troponin and baseline, but this may not always be necessary. Blood gases, usually we, we monitor blood gases till they are normalized. Feeding. So initially when we started cooling babies in the first few years, we didn't feed, but as we got more confident, we realized that we can feed. We do feed stable babies who are stable, hemodynamically stable. We give trophic feeds during the cooling. And after rewarming, we grade upon feeds. It's important to provide sedation and analgesia if necessary. So if a baby is ventilated, morphine or fentanyl infusion, the baby is not ventilated and if there's a lot of shivering and signs of distress, then we use chloral hydrate and paracetamol. So the signs of would be any tachycardia. So normally when you cool babies, the heart rate is usually around 80 to 100. If you have tachycardia, either pain or infection, or the baby is got, does not have encephalopathy, that's what we have found out. So if there's tachycardia, irritability, grimacing or shivering, we would consider giving some pain relief in the form of paracetamol or chloral hydrate or morphine and fentanyl if they're ventilated. Remember that drugs that are el eliminated through the P450 enzymes the symptom of the liver, liver is depressed. So morphine levels, phenobarb levels, all these levels are much, much higher than normally ex expected. So you need to be careful about what drugs, when you're giving drugs in these babies. Follow-up, this is our sort of follow-up that we 
usually do. We see them at three months, six months, nine months, 12 months, 15 months, and 18 to 24 months. At 18 to 24 months, we normally do a Bailey's or a Griffith. Uh, some, some people use the Darcy. At three months, we would do a general movements assessment. So this is a, go, a good thing to do for prognostication. We can also do ML Dyson and other visits we would do other than anthrop. So everywhere, every time it's important to follow up the head growth is very important because that correlates with the outcome. Other than anthropometry, you can also do a, a, a screening test in the other times that they come till you do the, do the formal Bailey's at 18 to 24 months. Now the question is, do you need AEG and MRI? AEG is a useful adjuvant, no doubt about it, but it's not a bust must so AEG can you do not need AEG to recruit babies for cooling even though the toby trial and many people do use it it is not a must it's useful for prognosis it's useful for seizure seizure detection but it's not a must mri it's if you have the facility i think as far as possible all babies who have hie and are cool should have an mri between day five to seven especially but if the diagnosis is in doubt. So if you don't know, if you're not 100% sure with asphyxia, if there's alternative diagnosis possible, it's useful to have a MRI. And if you want early prognosis, especially if you're considering withdrawal of care, it's very useful to have an MRI. Now, one other thing that we looked at in thin study was comparing the MRI with the general movements assessment. So for those of you, most of you will be aware of what general movements is. General movements is what is called the practical movements. So this is looking at doing a video of the baby at around 12 to 15 weeks, corrected gestation. And they have what is called a fidgety movements. So the absence of fidgety movements predicts cerebral palsy. This has been shown in a lot of studies for preterm babies. And what we did was we looked at MRI and compared MRI with general movement assessment. And what we found was the negative predictive value of absent fidgety movements on general movement assessment in our cohort of this 50 babies that we saw was same as that for those who had severely abnormal, moderate or severe MRI. So if you have, if you have, if you do not have the facilities of MRI on follow-up, it is excellent idea to get general movements assessment done because that has the same negative predictive value. Of course, this can be done, the general movements is done only at uh, uh, around three months. So you will not have an early prognosis what MRI will give you in the first week of life. But if for follow-up, this is an excellent, excellent tool that can be used, which is as good as MRI in predicting outcome. So in conclusion, I will just put up the questions again, and I hope you have got the answers. Should you cool babies? I've given you evidence to show that there is safety, efficacy, and feasibility in low middle income countries in a NICU setting. What facilities and settings, it's very, very important that we you have settings and facilities that provide good intensive care where you can cool babies. Are there any differences? I talked about the fact that you need to have babies who are more than 35 weeks, more than 1.8 kilos within six hours of age, either a low upguard or a low cord pH or an outbound babies not having cried at birth, but also have to demonstrate abnormal neurology, not just low or cord pH. Any alternatives? Yes, there are alternatives which work well. Only thing, they are not as good as servo and they need more intensive nursing care and input. How do you monitor and follow up? We went through that. It's very important that you have good monitoring and good follow up in place when you cool babies. And AEG is not a must. MRA is very useful, but you can manage without it. Thank you. Uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, the CMC Valor faculty, uh, Dr. Jana, my mentor, Sridhar Anil and Manish, my colleagues for many years, because all the work that I've done with cooling HIE has been possible because of them. Also want to acknowledge the nurse, nurses, my other colleagues and the parents and babies that have been part of the research and also my wife who made the slides. Thank you. I think uh, we should congratulate uh, Niranjan for uh, covering uh, the topic extensively. Uh, there are uh, many questions uh, which uh, the participants have put up. 
he has covered almost all important issues like using uh, servo control non servo control in gypmer we have tried gel packs initially mira cradle tecotherm but outcome is almost same it only depends upon how you are able to monitor and uh, look after the babies that's the most important thing so he has highlighted why the temperature should be constantly uh, monitored and uh, maintained and uh, also the slow rewarming which is important because suddenly eureka you are done cooling you leave he may go into hypothermia and create a problem and he also talked about uh, selective head cooling and whole body cooling now selective head cooling is no longer used as he said because there are mri studies which showed that uh, there is a difference between uh, cooled uh, on the head cool and the whole body cooling whole core body cooling is much more effective because the differential cooling in the brain is not there and the mri changes showed that there are difference although morbidity and mortality is not uh, much statistically significant and he has also highlighted why shivering and uh, uh, over cooling all this should be avoided because it will be counterproductive now we will take a few questions my co chair person uh, sunil kishore is also there first few questions i will ask from the audience niranjan will answer so does therapeutic hypothermia increase the need of mechanical ventilation dr niranjan yeah so if you look at the western studies about 60 to 80% of babies who were cool were ventilated now that is not our experience in our experience and i think uh, dr vishnu bhat can also uh, concur there's been that about 20% of our babies are ventilated so to answer your question does cooling increase the need for ventilation if it does it's very marginal it's not very much at all so i i would not ventilate a baby just because we are cooling the baby i would not do that the indication for ventilation would be other things so basically Uh, i agree with what nirajan says it does not increase the need for ventilation but we may cool the babies who need ventilation because with the ventilation also you may cool but obviously it does not increase maybe occasional case of pph and you know, some problem may develop but it uh, it uh, does not should we have create a therapeutic hypothermia center what is your opinion on that uh well so i think the question is whether we should have regional areas regional centers so that is the point that dr vishnu but also pointed out that transport is there are many many things that need to be placed before we have so most western countries and even here in melbourne if the, it is it is only the nikus that cool so any baby who is in the community or in a peripheral hospital who fulfills the criteria for cooling will be transported by the transport team within 6 hours and they would trans they would cool during transport and that's the model that works in most places and which is obviously the best model in the sense that if you de- develop one center that cools they will do it much better than if you cool one or two babies in a year so that is a, but that is a model that may not always be practical so in india it is very difficult because uh, the the facilities the infrastructure is very different so if you go to a rural area say in one of the states that have not much of health structure the priority there is providing care for the mothers antenatal care providing safe delivery you won't even raise the issue of cooling because it's probably not safe there you do not have a nico in the next 200 300 kilometers you can't take a baby there you would not do it whereas you have cities in urban area you have three or four centers that are doing good cooling then you should educate the obstetricians the pediatricians who cannot do cooling to say don't keep those babies here this is very this, they, they, these babies need to be cooled and then organize transport for them so it will be a mixture of the models that will work in our country if we anticipate asphyxia probably it is better to refer the mother early so that she can deliver in a center where cooling can be done otherwise as you rightly put it we should uh, develop more uh, centers where cooling can be done but it cannot be done at primary health center or where there no facility as you have rightly put it we should have the basic uh, uh, facilities to look after a sick baby before we cool that is very important now the next question uh, 
is between 6 and 24 hours cooling is beneficial or is it harmful after 6 hours but within so the nichd nichd study uh, recruited babies between 6 to 24 hours and what they found was that the benefit was marginal so it's not harm it's not more harm i wouldn't say more harm but the benefit was marginal now the first priority is for all doctors is do no harm uh, so we have to weigh the harms and benefits. So if, if you are a center that you've been cooling for many years and you have a baby who comes at eight, eight hours of age, you might decide that you want to offer that. So if you ask me what I would do, then in Velour, we were, we were not doing that. If a baby comes beyond six, six and a half, seven hours maximum, we would not, knowing the fact that, you know, there's a process of 72 hours, it's, it, is, it has its own effect. So we would not offer. There is not enough evidence for that. Yeah. So now the next question is, uh, suppose if there is uh, after asphyxia, whether you do passive cooling. Yeah, I think that is, uh, yeah. So when you see- I think you already covered this point. Yeah, I did cover that. So quickly, what we know is that passive cooling is unregulated and the passive cooling that has been done in transport, there are three or four studies that have shown that babies have arrived at temperatures that are not acceptable. So passive cooling is not, it cannot, you cannot, don't have control over the situation. It, it, you may hit the target temperature, you may not hit the target temperature. You could do passive cooling while waiting for at, active cooling. Like, uh, you know, when you are deciding about what to do, you could do passive cooling turn up. But even if you do that, whatever passive cooling you do, you still need to rec monitor the rectal te core temperature. That is very important because if you don't monitor the core temperature, you don't know what temperature the baby is heading to and you may cause definitely if the temperature drops less than 32, that is going to harm the baby. Now you answered already after six hours, but there is one more question on six to 12 hours. Of course, there are some minimal evidence maybe there, but as you rightly put it, after six hours is very difficult to decide. And of course, if you have facility for more cooling babies, uh, probably you can try because so a little benefit the baby may get, but definitely it is not going to be useful that much after six hours. As he rightly said, uh, earlier the better, within six hours, uh, three hours if you can do, it is still better. Then I, think the, yeah. the, I think the questions are uh, that question, I understand why the que <clears throat> these questions are coming because most that. outborn babies are come late. So that is a reason, but there is not enough evidence to show that if you cool babies after six hours, that is going to do them that much benefit. Now, there is one more question asking that after, after six hours, the baby looked all right with the asphyxia, but after that, it does conversion what to do. So, so to yeah. So uh, if, if you have a baby after six hours having seizures, you've lost the, you've lost the benefit of cooling. So, we don't cool babies like that. And it happens, it's not, it's not uncommon. So what we need to do is if, a, what, what you could do is, if it is an inborn baby, for outborn babies, you have no, nothing you can do, but inborn babies, if a baby fulfills a physiological criteria, then it's important to monitor the baby every half an hour to one hour. So that even before they have seizures, if they demonstrate abnormal tone, if they are drowsy, they would still fulfill criteria without seizures. But if a baby is coming to you without any encephalopathy and then developing seizures, it may not be asphyxia. It could be other things also. So if a baby, we would not call a baby who comes at eight hours with seizures, uh, unlikely to do that. Yeah, I agree with you. We should look for other causes or the resident was sleeping. He did not monitor properly. That also can happen. See, after the asphyxia, he looked all right. Many babies after resuscitation, they look all right. Then you leave him. Then the nurse calls, uh, he has got convulsion. So many times it is because of improper monitoring of these babies. Yeah. Yes, now that I, is important. That's very important to monitor. Now I will uh, leave some question to Sunil Kishore. I think he can continue for some more because we have got another 15 minutes. Yes. Sunil Kishore, you can ask the next questions. You can unmute yourself. Yeah, sure. Mm, Dr. Vijay Krishna is asking, do you routinely take consent before uh, uh, starting cooling? So consent before cooling. 
do i take i don't take i meaning our unit doesn't take should you take that's a debate uh, i would i can ask dr vishnu but to contribute to that because so we took we we take consent if it is a study so we did all the studies that we have done we took consent but once it entered a phase where we offer it for all babies we stopped doing studies we stopped randomizing once we stopped randomizing we have stopped taking consent because we feel that that is our, our standard of care and that is there in our protocol it is there in the entrance of the nursery that we offer therapeutic hypothermia it's one of the things that we offer so we do not take consent it's like taking consent for ventilation so if you are if you are worried about uh, being sued then do you take consent for ventilation surfactant therapy then take consent for cooling basically any invasive procedure or any procedure which uh, there is harm we should be informed it may be may not be written consent always but still now uh, it has not become a standard of care our uh, associations whether it's in nna for a iap nna for whatever it is they have not made it a mandatory thing uh, for th- hypoxia so till then uh, they will some people may consider it experimental but once you you have done studies and showed definitely better result you can inform the parents and then definitely cool just like what he said ventilation always you may not take a written consent but uh, you have to inform them definitely so we had talked to our legal uh, people regarding these things and what they said was if you have you do not have if you have a guideline so if you are if you have a written guideline in your unit and you have a rational behind it that will support you uh, if you want to be safe you should take consent there's no but the thing is the other way around also can come some parents may read google and come and say my baby is asphyxiated you're not having giving cooling what about that so it can work both ways yes, so in our unit also we are taking cooling as a, we are taking consent as of now sir so uh, since it is a standard of care down the line we need to see like whether to take consent or not dr pardasarde is asking like do we stop cooling if prothrombin time as well as aptt is significantly increased if there is significant coagulopathy shall we stop cooling so coagulopathy in blood test you don't need to stop cooling so what we have seen is if you test these babies about 60% of them have abnormal coagulation that probably is because of asphyxia itself which cooling just increases but all the 60% do not bleed so our protocol is we monitor the pt ptt if it is abnormal we correct it we do not stop cooling we would stop cooling if the baby is bleeding and we are not able to control the bleeding so we had one baby with a large subgeal bleed which kept bleeding and bleeding in spite of correcting the coagulopathy so for that baby we rewarmed the baby because we are not able to get on top of it at that point of time the harm seemed more than the benefit so just for blood test coagulopathy no just correct it you don't stop cooling but the baby has extreme clinical signs of hypotension because of large bleeding maybe yes yeah. <clears throat> dr kirti is asking like can we give formula feeds during therapeutic hypothermia if the baby is outborn <laughs> it's a good question uh, i don't use formula so i don't know we are lucky to have breast milk bank in velor uh, so the so if you look at the physiology in asphyxia we do know that the gut gut injury can happen and we do know that necrotizing enterocolitis can happen when you feed the babies so obviously i would be very very careful about it if i have eb uh, express breast milk or pasteurized donor milk i would use it for as not in full volume feeds uh, like a sort of trophic feed during cooling and we really go into full volume feeds and grading up of feeds only after rewarming i have not used formula uh, dr vishnu but can maybe share his experience and you also dr simsonil actually we also have breast milk bank so there is no need uh, in chipmer for giving uh, artificial feeds uh, as you rightly put it but i think uh, it is better to avoid artificial uh, milk or formula feeds as far as possible as you rightly put it but in anna ward if you want to feed small trophy feed it may, may not cause harm because you are feeding other babies but there all this risk of infection and uh, nec is higher it is better to avoid it is not necessary that you have to feed all babies 
during cooling actually what is talking about a trophic feeding not full feeding we usually avoid uh, full feed during cooling because we are not sure whether you develop pnc or we may not develop pnc so better to be careful what we are doing in our unit is like we are giving only minimal enteral nutrition that 10 to 15 ml per kilo per day for uh, that 72 hours period so uh, preferably ebm but if not available occasionally formula feeds and uh, once the baby comes out of uh, cooling then uh, like your feeding protocol any will any have it will follow and uh, i think you have already answered sir ventilation is it uh, not mandatory for cold babies so you told like uh, it's not mandatory uh, what are the chances of abnormal neurological outcome if mri shows hyper intensity or changes in thalamus or basal ganglia and what is the role of uh, mrs dr vijay is asking so there are a lot of studies that have with gives numbers so there are also at least three or four classifications by which you can classify the mri damage so if you have so this ganglia and thalamus can also be can classified as mild moderate and severe uh, and based on that you have numbers so if you have what is most important is if you have plic absence of the plic sign that gives you a 90% chance of having cerebral palsy but basal ganglion thalamus i think if you have severe damage is more than 60% chance of uh, uh, having cerebral palsy i don't i can't remember the exact numbers but there are several studies that gives you numbers and several classifications that you can use for that similarly with mrs i think the sensitivity specificity is about 90% of uh, predicting outcome and that also is a bit disputed some people say the na choline ratio some people say the uh, lactate peak but whatever it is the sensitivity is around 90% for us to predict outcome see we give uh, many anticonvulsants sometimes uh, neurological assessment becomes very difficult for few days after uh, this so mri will definitely help you in prognostication if there is severe damage you know that uh, there could be likely long lasting issue so as he rightly said normally first week we will not do at least after 5 6 days you may do mri better best may be in the second week which uh, may tell you the future outcome you hmm. among the different uh, findings neurological findings in uh, mri like the changes in thalamus and basal ganglia are associated with uh, profound uh, severe asphyxia so that's why it is associated with the poor neurological outcome as compared to selective neuronal necrosis and uh, this thing so definitely like uh, the outcome will be worse if there are changes in uh, plic or thalamus or basal ganglia so how frequently to monitor the electrolytes during cooling so uh, when we initially started cooling we used to monitor it every 24 hours but as we put our numbers together and we gain more experience we realized we don't need to do that so what we do is we do it at 24 hours and we do it at 72 hours that's the two two times that we do our electrolytes uh but most of the time we do not have much problems with that that has been our experience dr vishnu but and sunil can contribute also yeah yeah same what you are telling is fine see electrolytes of course abnormality can occur even with hypoxia without cooling also so people have reported hyponatremia and if your uh, yeah, fluid is not uh, in a given sometimes hypernatremia can occur but mostly it is hyponatremia because of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion so it is necessary sometimes suppose especially baby has got convulsions you may think for calcium electrolyte and all these things because that could also be cause of convulsion in addition to hypoxia but otherwise routinely it may not be needed all the time 24 hours and 72 hours may be fine in otherwise normal baby yes sir sure uh, can mira cradle can be used during transport uh, and what are the precautions to be taken if at all it's being used dr vijay is asking uh the problem is that when you use a mira cradle you need a heat source because sometimes the uh, baby's temperature does drop so if, and it also is difficult to fit that cradle in a transport uh, place so we are 
we had started working on a transport model so it would be an ideal if you had a transport incubator with a vera cradle inside where you could auto regulate the temperature but we have not used it so far if somebody has to try it out they can try it out i guess what is the role of a neurosonogram and uh, ri i think uh, he is asking about resistive index in uh, uh, nsg so is there any role of nsg and ri so the problem with the resistive uh, index is that cooling does not the prognosis when you cool babies the ri does not correlate with prognosis not as good as when you not cool so that is the problem with ri in uh, uh, in cooling neurosonogram is useful because it's bedside you can rule out other conditions like bleeds you can pick up uh, hyper uh, densities and hypodensities in the basal ganglia and the cortex you can pick it up if you're good so it's a bedside tool and i think everybody uses it and uh, more and more people who are trained know how to use it and it's a use, easy easy to, tool to use and gives does give you some information so uh, nsg is useful to exclude other causes like a bleeding and, yes uh, uh, yes obviously ri like uh, at that point of time it won't help in decision making so anyhow you have taken the decision of cooling then you yeah ask. and the prognosis does not uh, correlate the ri prognosis sensitivity is not as good when you are cooled some of the questions are repeated i think there is one question on magnesium sulfate during cooling i think jipmer we have uh, conducted this study on magnesium sulfate and cooling and what we noted uh, was there is no additional benefit of magnesium sulfate over along with cooling because probably you get the as much benefit as possible with the cooling after that uh, you probably there is not much added benefit but maybe marginal difference may be there because uh, slight improvement in the outcome was there but it is not uh, statistically significant mm-hmm. yeah continue sunil yeah, two yeah. more questions so uh, can... is asking as a uh, eyeball figure in your experience what proportion of uh, perinatal asphyxia babies were eligible for cooling so i don't have the numbers actually so i think the question is how many babies with low apgar and low cot ph develop hie as compared to those who don't develop hie I, i think that's what i understand from the question i would say i mean if you i don't have statistics in the sense i am looked at the data but i would say that about 50 60% of them actually don't develop hie it's more of number of babies who don't develop hie than who develop hie just on low cot ph and low apgar see if a baby has neurological abnormality without uh, low blood ph and uh, base deficit it may be like likely to be some other cause maybe it may be brain injury it may be due to some primary brain uh, problem itself so they may not have really hypoxia as such they may be having other problems neonatal encephalopathy yeah that is why he has uh, specifically mentioned about abg and uh, uh, base deficit but in outborn baby sometimes it becomes problem because the baby comes late so we don't have the abg so there you take a chance you may be in the right track you may have the long track so it is problem sometimes but uh, hypoxia babies uh, as we which how many you are cooled you are asking questions see whoever fulfill the criteria we cool no that's what we do see i think i think the question was uh, those who have perinatal asphyxia as in terms of low apgar and low cot ph how many of them you cool as in they who fulfill the neurological criteria so i understood as see apgar is a, although it's objective it becomes subjective many times because you do not really look at the watch you do not look at the time then after research and baby okay one minute maybe this two minutes uh, five minutes maybe this like that you right although it is objective it uh, often becomes subjective so object uh, abga per se may not be a real uh, indicator of asphyxia you should look at the abg and other things and the neurological abnormality with the low abgar is important both should be there so it is not just a neurological abnormality without asphyxia both asphyxia should be there and a neurological abnormality also should be there in a mild asphyxia of course the outcome is good whether you cool or not so that's why many people do not uh, advise cooling because of the side effects may be associated but in moderate hypoxia it is the best 
I think everybody must be having the similar experience over schooling. Severe asphyxia, we cannot say may this way, that way. So you should catch hold of the moderate asphyxia babies early, cool them, and you will get the best benefits of cooling. And whether it's India or USA or UK, I don't think it makes a difference. It's only the people who make the difference, not the babies. Babies are same. If you wait for uh, uh, American or a UK men to come and tell you cooling, you will never do anything in India because I don't think we have any evidence for many of the practices which we are doing. We read the books, we practice. If it works, works. If it does not work, it does not work. But I think now we have so much evidence uh, in favor of cooling. And I think Jipmar, we must have randomized more than 1,000 babies. Wherever I go, they ask, sir, are you sure it is uh, will be effective? Okay, let us do one more study. So like that, we went on doing. And I think still the questions keep coming. I don't think people will be satisfied. But I think there is an end to everything. And I feel cooling is uh, definitely effective. It should be done. And it should become a standard of care. Only thing is, uh, there should be proper facility, as uh, Dr. Niranjan and uh, Dr. Uh, Sunil Kishore told. The facility should be available. That's important. And uh, I think uh, final comments, Sushil Kumar can add, Sushil Kish Sunil Kishore can add. And then we close probably because we were asked to close by 6.30. Yes, yes, sir, somebody is asking like even in mild encephalopathy, HIE stage 1, uh, can we, should we offer cooling or not? So I think sir was already I mentioned. Think, I think the background is that there are a few studies that have come out recently that shows that uh, initially when we say mild encephalopathy, the thought was that uh, they're all normal. But there are recent studies, MRI and clinical studies that show that this they have MRI changes and they do have problems like learning disabilities and things like that later in life. There is a, I think there's a, there, there will be a trial soon on mild encephalopathy randomization, but the numbers are going to be huge because if you're going to show ben that benefit, you need to follow them up to, you know, eight years, 10 years before you find. My thought, thought on this is that first, let's do moderate and be very good in it before we, we are not even doing moderate. Why, why think of mild? Not yet. I wouldn't, I wouldn't cool mild. Having said that, most of the Western countries, even where I work now, uh, the, there's what is called a, th a therapeutic drift. So people are cooling, giving the benefit of the doubt and cooling babies with mild. I would say 30-40% of the babies are cooled actually mild without enough evidence. Anything I think we start, we should be confident with the more risky babies and then we go for the milder cases. As he rightly put it, uh, milder cases also may have some neurological problem later, problem may be there. So they may also be benefited and I think many people believe that milder uh, cases also may be cooled. But uh, side effects or the adverse effects with the moderate and severe asphyxia, we should control first. We should get good uh, experience we should get. Then probably we can uh, go for mild asphyxia babies. Yeah. Since uh, therapeutic hypothermy is now being considered as standard of care, and most of the units are, uh, especially in India, now starting actually. So many even uh, in tight two cities also. So now we should more concentrate more on quality improvement, improving the nursing care, and uh, making a follow protocol. Uh, monitoring aspects. So all these things we need to improve uh, before uh, going on to other aspects like milder cooling and uh, uh, milder encephalopathy cooling and all these things. Sir, thank you very much, sir, for the, your wonderful uh, lecture. And uh, sir, shall we hand over to the organizers? Sir? Yeah, yeah. There are more than 60, 70 questions. I think uh, you can uh, email Dr. Niranjan for further inquiries because we have to close people may become restless after some time. Yeah, we will hand over to the organizers. And in Melbourne, we have entered the next day now. It's past midnight. But you are enthusiastic, you see. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, I'm passionate about this. So. Yes. So we will go to the organizers now. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor Niranjan, Professor Vishnu Bhatt. Uh, and Dr. Sunil, before we move on to what of thanks, there is a small announcement. We were uh, supposed to have three webinars on 
neuro protection in december uh, the second one was scheduled uh, mid uh, month uh, on updates and controversies in uh, therapeutic hypothermia by professor sita shankaran but uh, due to some technical reasons we had to uh, can uh, postpone that session so we will have a different session on 14th of december we are going to have uh, safety issues the five prong approach by professor gautam suresh and then the third webinar on neuroprotection which is scheduled will go on as scheduled on 23rd uh, on a very novel concept uh, that is on using technology to protect brains in resource limited setting something that has been proven by, by a team led by uh, dr gabriel from brazil so the same team will be presenting that on 23rd of december so the next webinar will be on 14th of uh, 14th on safety issues in nicu including the medication errors and things like that and how to tackle them the five prong approach now uh, may i request uh, my colleague uh, dr manjusha to kindly propose a word of thanks thank you thank you sir on behalf of team iap neocon 2020 2021 i wholeheartedly thank our legend for today professor dr niranjan thomas for being with us all this time, despite the different time zones we are in, uh, Sir has been so passionate about the topic that he, has, he had agreed to sit, uh, as Sir already mentions, almost the next day there. And uh, we could have never have got anyone much better than you to talk on this topic, Sir. Thank you so much for joining us. And um, I, this top session would not have been complete uh, without the excellent moderation by our uh, moderators, Professor Dr. Vishnubhat, Sir, and Dr. Sunil Kishore, sir, who themselves are legends in the same topic uh, and uh, known all over uh, India. And I thank all the participants on Zoom as well as on YouTube for their active participation, the expert for today. And we look forward to your participation in our upcoming uh, session on 14th of December at 7.30 p.m. That's a Monday on patient safety in an ICU of five-pronged approach by Professor K. Suresh Gautam from USA. Till then, it's Tang from Team IAP Neocon 2020-2021. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Thank you, one and all. Thank you. Thank you very much.